Welcome back. I hope everyone has had a lovely uh, lunch break and been in the fireside chats and lots of uh, good networking activity. Um, welcome to this session uh, where we're going to be looking at uh, actions for nature um, and all of the things that we um, if you haven't come across me yet already, I'm Matt Postles. I'm Deputy Director at the Natural History Consortium, uh, who are putting on Communicate today. Um, and we also have uh, lots of public facing programs that our partners come together around. I'll just talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Um, but also to welcome uh, Sarah Staunton Lamb as well from Earthwatch. And Sarah, if you'd like Hi, to Matt. introduce yourself. Hi, yes. Um, it's nice to see there's a few familiar names coming up in the uh, in the people list. So hello to those of you who've already met me before. Uh, yeah, my name's Sarah and I'm the Senior Learning and Engagement Manager at Earthwatch Europe. Um, so yeah, really, really looking forward to this session. Hopefully, um, uh, yeah, Matt and I are going to pose some quite thoughtful uh, and provocative questions to you lot out there. Absolutely. And so part of the idea for this session is that uh, this isn't a uh, Two piece from uh, me and Sarah. We're very much going to be getting uh, you involved in the chat as well, and it's great to see that so many people are already um, answering our first poll and provocation um, in the chat as well. Um, so uh, great to, to have you engaging, and hopefully um, your um, typing fingers uh, are still uh, still got some energy left in them to uh, to get stuck in. Um, but we thought. Initially, what we'd start off with is just to uh, do a little bit of provocation. You know, we're talking about um, activating people to take on individual actions. Um, and um, I just wanted to start off. I'm going to see if my uh, slides will let me um, share here. So I've just got a couple of slides to uh, bring up. If that's working. Um, and I think I just wanted to start off with the, the question, you know, we spend a lot of our time as communicators um, asking people to do stuff um, and and just take a quick step back to think about why we um, we are asking. And so, um, you know, we a lot of the problems that we are trying to solve um, as uh, people working in the environmental sector are, are they the result of people's um, actions and existence. Um, as well, so um, you know, we think of uh, a lot of these things. They are they are outcomes of um, you know human activity that we're trying to tackle. Be that you know species extinction, pollution, climate change, um, over harvesting, um, things like that. Um, they're not necessarily things that we're intending to do, but they are they are outcomes of activity that we're taking. Um, but then we also see you know a huge amount of positive um, activity that comes out of um, human action as well, and. Basically, the, the sort of idea being that the interventions that we as communicators are trying to put out there are fundamentally attempts to, to influence people to do more of the good stuff um, and less of the bad stuff. Um, and for quite a long time, there was this kind of um, way of framing this um, discussion that was very much around, you know, somebody somewhere needs to make a decision. Um, are we going to do the right thing and save the world or are we not? Um, the problem is that, you know, that kind of uh, sets us some sort of who is this person who's, uh, you know, mouse is hovering over over the uh, button there. Um, and, you know, in reality is not quite so clean and simple. Um, and, you know, we don't have this kind of top down one person controls all. Um, it's a much messier system um, that really comes from the grassroots and, and you know, in reality it's much more um, emergent where millions of small actions um, lean to you know create the trends that that lead towards kind of larger change um, and I suppose that's sort of part some of the the reasoning or the rationale um, that we lean into kind of asking people to take these actions um, but we actually um, at uh, the Natural History Consortium, where our partners come together um, to uh, engage people with with a lot of different actions for nature, um, we found that we had um, this real challenge. So I've already mentioned it in other sessions, but in case you've missed those, is that when, uh, we also have a public facing program called the Festival of Nature, um, where we bring together over 150 organizations to uh, deliver events where we are engaging people with, with lots of different calls to action. You know, each of those 150 organizations brings their own call to action. Um, and so it feels like we're kind of, and, and it feels like we're kind of bombarding um, our audiences with hundreds of different things that they could do. There's so many ways to change the world with these small um, actions that people can take. 
But we sort of hear back time and again that there's so many things that actually people feel like there's this bit of paralysis of choice. How you know can doing these small things really make a difference, and which one should I do? And so one of the things, one of the challenges that just in our kind of microcosm of the festival and our many partners with their many um, calls to action was that we had to. Um, think about well how do we frame that in a useful way and help our audiences and our visitors navigate that blizzard of calls to action and pick and choose the ones um, that would apply most to their own circumstances and their own lives. So we drilled down and did quite a lot of work to, to try and analyze all of our calls to action. So we asked all of the organizations that were taking part was to um, was to ask, OK, what are the calls to action that you're putting out to visitors through the festival? And we found that whilst there were probably as many calls to action as there were um, organizations, we also found that really they all um, could be distilled down into four different kind of flavors um, of call to action as well. And we came up with a bit of a framework that we called sort of taking action for nature. Um, and this was in 2019 that we, oh, I'm on the wrong laptop. Uh, this was in 2019 that we put together this framework, which is why it's got the date on there. And under this title of take action for nature, we came up with these kind of four different categories of the things that we're actually asking people to do could all fit into one of these. So we're either asking people to take less, to, you know, reduce their consumer footprint in some way um, or we're asking them to choose better you know choose an alternative energy source or to um, you know, choose a more sustainable alternative to something that they do consume um, we're also asking people to demand more from uh, the decision makers in society whether that be um, through policy makers or um, organizations with power like big uh, companies that people are buying their products from um, or we were asking people to give back in some way, whether that was through um, donating time as a volunteer or through donating cash um, or um, giving back some sort of space in their garden to plant a tree or something like that as well. So we generally were, we were able to build this bit of a communication framework to, to say, well, actually, we're not asking people to do 150 different things. We're asking people to do one of four things. Um, and then all of our 150 different things were different examples of ways that people could do that. It just helped to try and distill some of that down. Since then, what we've um, found is that this um, concept um, that kind of evolved out of, out of that challenge of how we get 150 organizations to kind of sing with the same voice um, at the Festival of Nature has had a lot of resonance. We've talked about it a bit at Communicate before, but we've um, seen that uh, it's also started to be adopted by different organizations and one of the interesting things here in um, Bristol where we are at the moment is that the um, local authority who uh, you know Bristol City Council uh, were the first city to announce an ecological emergency um, and have wrapped this um, framework into their individual action calls uh, for the one city plan for the environment that's looking to tackle that um, ecological emergency as well. So it feels like it's got traction. It feels like it's a useful thing to discuss and bring into the um, into the conference. And I think one of the things that we really are interested in bringing, drawing out some of your thoughts on in this session as well is um, how we might use a sort of common common language and common framework to help us present a more united um, call to action to our um, joint audience as the sector. So that's the bit of provocation from me. Uh, I'll just close off my um, slides there. And um, on that note, it'd be great to hear uh, some of what's going on in the chat. Sarah, would you like to just while I um, open up some more polls and things, would you like to have a, a little reflection of what people have been saying in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's really, it's been in, thank you for sharing some of your kind of ideas about um, calls to action and things that you've been involved with. Um, the one that, now where where have you gone? Um, I think that Sophie talked about um, using traffic uh, as the connect across communities, so encouraging people to take action about things they care about, speeding air pollution, safety, lobbying, as a sort of finding a finding a, a point that kind of worked within a community um, and that that's certainly been um, uh, picked up by a few of you out there. Uh, there's some practical practical things here in terms of things like um, 
Uh, we've got a new, I think, a new forest based one here about not feeding or touching the wild ponies, slowing down across the, the forest for livestock, um, sort of taking action and responsibility there. So that's that's some very direct calls for action mm. on a specific geographical space. Um, against that, we've also got um, Catherine Smith talks about encouraging farmers to take action for wildlife on the land. So obviously that's now a, a much more landscape uh, wide approach to taking action um, and then Joe Hooper really nice of um, practical one about visiting an orchard and growing local fruit so making people aware of local opportunities and things that are on their are on their doorstep um, the other one I think appeals to me uh, there we go I think Paul Cock talked about taking action for sharks which was an immediately sprung to mind on me um, but again then linking that to beach combing um, egg case hunting um, storytelling so it sounds like a call to action through a sort of big charismatic species but actually with some very specific mm -hmm. practical practical calls within that and I think that's, that's it's really interesting as well and we've just dropped another um, poll and a uh, question uh, which I'm just going to pin actually just so that it doesn't keep disappearing off the top um, but think about you know a question to you in the uh, out there in the chat um, is you know think about what is the one outstanding call to action that you've seen you know what have you, have you seen this year that has really stood out to you as like yes they, they've done that really well um, or you know if you've seen some some really uh, shockers as well of people really badly framing their calls to action as well you know great to, to hear about some examples of those um, and in the poll section we've also dropped in another one about that kind of multiple calls to action and see how people kind of feel when they when they um, experience them out in the wild as well and while people are kind of answering some of those questions and following through in the chat I wonder if Sarah do you want to kind of give your um, bit of um, provocation as well to kick start a bit more discussion? So, so a long part of this so we've um, Matt's talked talk there about sort of framing it as an individual call to action but I think that the thing that sits alongside this actually is the um, the community call to action so um, certainly the organization I work for Earthwatch um, We've got a project called Naturehood, which is around um, individuals taking action for wildlife in their garden, but also on a community scale. Um, and I think we went into this particular project um, that we're working on um, in Birmingham with the sort of, OK, this is a project we've got. It's around engaging people. It's around engaging communities. What's not like? Um, but we've been working as part of a wider NERC funded project called Engaging Environments. And what, what we've done is kind of turn the idea of community engagement in, in, a, in a project on its head. So rather than us going in and going, Naturehood is great, it's a really engaging project, Ta-da! why don't you do it? And we've kind of flipped that round to start working with the communities. And that in itself is quite a challenge because communities are made up of lots of individual groups and communities but trying to work with lots of people on the ground um, in certain areas of Birmingham to kind of understand what's important to them so we can then frame our project in a way that is both engaging appealing and relevant so my sort of piece around my provocation piece is to sort of building on what what Matt talked about so a there's a lot of calls for action out there but there's a lot of um there's a lot of very worthy very needy very important um actions we want people to take in a lot of cases it would be more impactful and have greater resonance if those actions were taken by the community or by, by more than one individual um and i guess my sort of provocation is around so how many of you um for how many of you is working with at a community level and a community scale important um, and how and how much of your work is spent looking at how do you get the community perspective on what you do um, and so it's how do you change that kind of this is this is us telling you what we think you should be doing into what's important to you and how can we make that relevant um, so yeah very interested in that sort of community aspect of of, of agency um, and how we how do we reframe reframe the ask how do we how do we become relevant to communities um, and I think the other thing is you know how you know and also is it up to us to decide that we are important communities so how do communities find us 
to know that that were relevant so yeah lots of lots of questions in that in that mix mm. i think it's really interesting as well that we're seeing quite a lot in the chat now about um you know some of the things that people saw that were that were really um useful um were around this kind of the messaging around uh covid measures and um things as well and it's quite interesting that um you know we look at these kind of clear calls to action in that are very much in that kind of top-down um, context of you know this is the government telling everyone what to do and how that kind of comes through and it's really interesting to see what kind of backlash and things have come out through that as well um, and thinking how that's that's kind of the complete opposite end of what you're talking about there as well Sarah of, of you know that being more kind of people driven and people adopted this is a a kind of top-down enforcement um that also has um you know the the national budgets and the national priority um and headline grabbing around it as well that kind of that that most of us are not working with those kind of resources to be able to share messages on such a scale so it'd be really interesting to hear what people think as well about you know how what is it about those messages is it the scale of being able to get out and hammer home that message or is it something about how those messages were put together um as well that, that there's some, there's some great out. great comments coming in and i think there's this um sue anthel mentions it and it gets picked up a few times yeah. about people's willingness to take of actions often hinge on whether or not they feel they have a choice mm. Um, and one of the things that we've really discovered on the project that we've been working in Lavelle's uh, uh, area of Birmingham is that um, where choice is limited, being able to sort of say, do you want to get involved in this project or not? It's not that simple. Mm. Um, there are certain, yeah, certain other conversations that you need to have, uh, an understanding of what's important to the community that you need to have before you even get anywhere else with your kind of uh, initial ask. Um, I think, where are we? Adam from um, RSPB talking about um, the new uh, community empowerment team is starting to look at the, the idea of just rethinking some of the traditional engagement routes. Um, you know, just because this is the way we've always done it before doesn't make it right. Um, and I think it's really healthy that, that organisations are you know taking a look at their approaches and sort of seeing how they can how they can reframe things and i think it's quite interesting as someone's mentioned in it uh, i think sophie lagan as well has mentioned the one of the previous sessions talking about agency as well and agency is in our title for this session and so that kind of unlocking individual agency and i think part of the challenge around agency is that people don't necessarily realize the influence that they have uh, or the impact that they have and we quite often see some some uh usually some sort of channel four documentary or something that's saying um you know if you save up all your plastic bottles that you use in one year you'd be you know it would fill your house um you know three times over or whatever whatever it might be um and so it's kind of there's it, i think we've always had that struggle of you know when we when we are putting out these calls to action that are kind of designed to be small manageable introductory little changes that that um that people can take on how um does that translate um actually because you know the some of the pushback on that that we get is oh well it's only something small actually i don't have that much input anyway mm. Yeah, I was just uh, reading, I think Joe uh, Hooper talks about it's hard to cut through the noise. People have been bombarded with so many calls to action, so linking to your piece, um, that perhaps fatigued and unsure about which to prioritise um, and making the action as simple as possible helped. Mm. And just before this session, Matt and I were talking, um, something that had come up recently in discussions I was having with the, the team that work on the ground in Birmingham was something like no mo may, a because it's alliterative and everybody likes something that kind of works like that um it although i think it was plant life that established it um it was definitely taken on board by lots of organizations earthwatch promoted it national trust the wildlife trust it was a very simple call to action um and had a lot of traction worked really well in terms of um social media people taking pictures of verges of areas of ground i um, mean it was something that felt quite tangible and quite manageable um and i think for me that 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 was a sort of very simple and successful mm. kind of call to action that worked well for communities 
in particular. Absolutely. And I think that kind of leads a bit into some of the questions that we've been asking about, you know, what, what brilliant bits of communication people have seen. I can see as well from the chat that clearly a lot of people are joining us from uh, the behavioural science session that we had just before this with Chris Meyer as well, um, where Chris would have been outlining a lot of the evidence and, and a lot of the um, scientific theory and psych psychology behind some of these um, mm -hmm. ways that, that people make their de behavioural decisions as well. Um, and uh, which I think is fantastic to have that kind of then coming feeding this session as well with with some of those insights and ideas. Um, some of these things around social norms, freedom of choice, um, and um, getting you know where things are are part of the kind of normal social architecture to behave in a certain way as well. Mm -hmm. But I think part of what we want to really drill down into into this session is more thinking about you know we are asking people to do things quite often as organizations we will put out you know is it don't use a plastic bottle is it plant some seeds um is it you know go and plant a tree um and often we do that in a very broadcasty way it's kind of um there, there's kind of something linking back to other things we've had in the in the conference as well around um intersectionality and inclusion and how you know how we frame yeah you know, we we started actually with um thinking about this session of around kind of the wildlife gardening ask um way back when we were putting it together and thinking about how you know we every every time we talk about wildlife gardening we talk about how you know a huge proportion of uh, people don't have gardens um but it's still one of the it's still top of the list of asks that um, many of the organizations you know in the room will will put out there um and thinking about how we decide on those asks and how they come together as well as how we activate them yeah i was i was just wanted to pick up on um something that alice and riley mentioned which is about it sometimes it's tricky to define exactly who your community and audience is um and i think that's a really important point and it's certainly something that has has come up in the engaging environment project that we've been involved in is around um we talk about all of the communities we can talk about uh hard to reach we can talk about um uh, traditionally ignored um and it's the fact that there are lots of different ways to frame and talk about and articulate about who community members are and that in itself is quite tricky mm. um it's definitely linked to the kind of the language of how we talk about communities um and that again is where it's really important to to understand what is important on a community level and therefore how do those members of a particular community refer to themselves mm. because that will affect what the ask is and what they're likely to respond Absolutely. um as well i think that might be a really good time uh sarah as well for us to uh try out um maybe inviting a couple of people who've been uh commenting in the chat to maybe join us um on the stage as it were on the digital stage mm -hmm. i'm just looking through as you can see um emma burt from uh, rspb has uh received lots and lots of uh, back comments um so may want to um, jump in to um, elaborate a little bit. There she is. She's jumped in. So hopefully <laughs> we'll let us in. And I wonder if there's anyone else who'd like to sort of jump in. Hi, Emma. Um, as Hi, well. Guys. Or if anyone would like to Hi, nominate yeah. someone, who is what we had happening in other sessions of people who, uh, who else you have seen in the chat that you'd really like to hear a bit more from. But whilst we sort of wait for some nominations to come through, Emma, you've you've had a lot of people replying to you in the chat as well. So they, they, they put you on the spot, not me. That's what I'm. That's what I'm claiming. No, that's fine. <laughs> but it'd be great if you to um, elaborate on some of the points that you've been making in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's good to see you again, mate. Um, thank you, guys. I th yeah, I've kind of put myself on the spot a bit here, haven't I? <laughs> um, so I suppose it just comes from um, my previous experience um, with Back from the Brink, um, which you may still running. It actually, it was a national lottery funded, which is now a heritage lottery funded piece of work, sorry. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. It was eight conservation organisations all coming together um, with one goal, which was to save really, really niche species. And uh, my role was the within communications for that project. Um, and I've, I've now moved on to working uh, as part of the community empowerment team with Adam Murray, who you guys would have seen um, uh, um, talking in the chat as well. Um, but I think the learnings from that project was just that the sheer 
impact that you could have as a partnership coming together was just amazing not not only on the ground um, with you know shared resources shared learning you know i was based at the rspb and yet we had smaller organizations like bumblebee conservation who could finally have access to resources that that they didn't mm. um you know and so that was that was just beautiful um and then also just the the impact that we were having on the public you know the the fact that we had these eight conservation organizations talking together and conversing on social media you know or coming together for events it was just fantastic it was amazing we were part of the festival of nature um, and you know we had a we had plant life there and bug life and staff from all these different organizations and it was lovely and I feel that it doesn't happen enough and that if we are you know wouldn't wouldn't the absolute dream be that if all these organizations who are essentially doing the same thing we're all passionate about the same thing we all want nature to have a brighter better future that's it that's the pure mm. essence of it if if we want to have more impact then surely coming together um you know br unifying our approach to people on people and our approach to engagement and putting people first as, as you know a people powered movement and really pushing that for nature mm -hmm. i just feel we would be unstoppable and and you know the impact we'd have would just be so much greater than what we're currently achieving and, and i don't i should stick it i don't want to say this in a space of you know preaching to a choir or you know putting down the the current conservation work that we're doing i absolutely believe that we're doing some amazing work but i just feel that um we have a bit of a we're in a bit of a rut uh, potentially of, of working in these silos and we should be sharing and not just within the sector i should stipulate also outside of the sector and talking to the specialists that work with communities we're not the specialists we're the nature specialists or sorry guys i'm talking from an environmental perspective the co communication specialists or whatever so 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 rather than trying to be a specialist of everything let us collaborate mm. so it's, it's just yeah collaboration and partnership i don't think there's any negative aside from the challenges that you get with it and i know all about those um but the the positives outweigh that so much i think it's truly the way to go anyway i'm sorry no, i get far too passionate i go off for hours <laughs> fantastic no we did we did say that we might just do a, a, a time limit so that we could just boot people off if they went on for too long but that's absolutely <laughs> that, that's absolutely perfect emma thank you very much yeah, like a sort of a thing yeah. that people get <laughs> um <laughs> But I think we, so. What we'll do is, if uh, Emma, thank you very much for for as well. We'll we'll we will boot you off unceremoniously, but you're obviously still here. Thank you very much. Um, but I think really interesting then as well coming through because I think one of the one of the interesting challenges that we have is that you know a partnership has no has is not something new um, for for bringing these things together, and it takes a huge amount of internal work to to um, manage those partnerships um and to bring them together and sort of how we share that resource so it's really interesting i think someone uh i've always scrolled away up now that someone was sort of saying you know even if it's even if it's on the level across sector of having a little bit more of the you know um you show me yours i'll show you mine um type uh attitude to to it because i think there's a real risk where we have organizations particularly organizations that are reliant on their communications that, that feed an income stream you know membership um based organizations and um you know we, we are all competing for the same grants we're all competing for the same attention um in that space as well it's really interesting to think maybe how people think we can we can get around or, or you know get past some of that i know there's huge great collaborations like back from the brink and things that are that that are coming together but will they this is my devil's advocate question now is will they always be limited by how much we can bring together will they still be will they be partnerships but still silosed from other parts of um of the community as well and is part of that Alan, the sort of uh, the, the limited amount of funding in the pot for everybody mm -hmm. so that um they're fit often organizations feel the need to say how different and special they are so that they get the money from the pot mm. when actually we need to find ways to explore better links and better partnerships of, of using the same money but it's um mm. it's yeah it's, uh, it's an interesting 
way forward. And it, yeah, in my in my head, um, I think partnerships are absolutely the the way forward. Um, but as, as the chat has sort of talked about, um, they're not easy. Yeah. Um, although I think there's a couple of comments on the chat about um, funders love partnerships. Yeah. So if we've got limited amounts of money um, and we can demonstrate the opportunities, um, then that's that's a really positive way forward. The other thing in terms of partnerships that um, that that is also important is, is the is the community element of that partnership. So um, the communities and the groups who were engaging within our calls to action um, have their own agendas, their own needs, and their own kind of other issues that they're sort of dealing with. So how do we how do we best broker those kind of partnerships, mm. um, especially as uh, there seems to be an increasing amount of funding available for the kind of the, the grassroots side of stuff, the, the, the smaller groups on the ground. And some of the bigger organisations are, you know, as a conduit to getting money to those grassroots organisations. Mm. So is that the best mechanism of supporting kind of local communities is another question. Absolutely. And I think we'd, there's, there's another kind of frame coming in that maybe um is a bit more internalized as well but some people sort of thinking about you know some of the just the sharing of learning um and um evaluate how evaluation feeds that kind of sector um space um i see as well caroline mentioning echo chambers um keeping things within our own little um bubbles of uh, information all oh, things are moving things are moving really fast now <laughs> um, there we go um, the other, I mean, the uh, um, Caroline's point about market research actually is really important, and it, it, there's, there's bits and pieces that we've done at, at Earthwatch recently, um, inspired um, actually by where's she gone, Kate Measures, um, and some of the work that Heritage Insider did with us around our um, Nature's program was was actually finding out kind of what do what do people think of us and what do people think about the environmental ask generally. Um, and we've had some really interesting kind of insights into um, into sort of different societal sectors mm. and where and where we're sort of prioritised. Um, and it's definitely worth doing to help kind of frame the, the sort of the communications and the you know what are people willing to get involved with and what are what would an environmental ask be mm. that that people would be willing to get involved with? Absolutely, I think that might be another good opportunity to bring bring some people on. And actually, I've seen so there's there's three people maybe in here who I think it would be. Let's be ambitious and see if we can bring three people three on. People. Wow. See if it works. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I so there's there's a few people in here that I you know Caroline a uh, a strop I think would has has made some really interesting points. Caroline, if you wanted yeah. to to jump up with us, but also Kate Measures as well. It might be good to elaborate on what you were saying, Sarah about um some of the yeah. things and then there's also there's um nisha bevan um who i know is sort of bristol based and, and has been doing a lot around um inclusivity as well in some of these things that might be great to to bring across so we've got kate jumping in um if you if if i put you on the spot then don't feel like you you uh, have to uh, join us. Well, hi kate hi kate um, i'm not wearing my pajamas isn't it yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we like to surprise people with uh, <laughs> with, with things as well. Um, Kate, do you want to maybe sort of elaborate on some of what you've been talking about in in the the chat as well? And we'll see if uh, if either uh, the Caroline or um, Nisha uh, are able to join in as well. We may we may run into tech issues, but we'll we'll see how we do. We like the challenge. Yeah. So we've worked on quite a few projects, and obviously Naturehood um, with Sarah, and also Back from the Brink um, uh, with Emma, um, and also um, Natia Rambith, which is the Welsh version of um, Back from the Brink, which has just been developed at the moment, of which we are putting some of this into action um, directly. So we're taking this learning and some of the stuff we learned yesterday, we're putting directly into action in the project program and what an eight million or well, seven and a half million pound project will look like. Um, so it is getting done on the ground, which is great. But part partnership is really hard and it's one of those things that comes out again and again um, in project evaluation reports um, and are also in project evaluations it's totally frustrated that like 70% of what we do is project evaluations but so little of those actually get shared but there are so many repetitive themes coming up and I just feel like we need more opportunities like this where people are willing to honestly share 
what they have learned um and um and actually to kind of um get away from the fact that we we are working in silos and often reinventing the same wheel again and again and again um and especially when we how many communicate conferences have there been uh we started in 2004 Okay, so we've been trying to crack <laughs> this nut about how to get people to change their behaviour and actions. And, you know, I've heard Chris speak maybe four times um, and um, people have been putting stuff into action, but we're still not cracking it. So we need to up the game mm. as a sector and that's one of the things that like Natia and Beth at every program we're now developing we're putting in money for to increase sector capacity and um sector resilience and partnership working um mm. so that we can hopefully start to you know kick start that a little bit more and get some more funding behind it because it's really important and the dog wants to join so <laughs> oh, but it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a from home if we didn't have at least one on camera <laughs> I should, I should leave you. Thank, Thank you. you. I mean, it's interesting, this idea of kind of sharing experiences. One of the best conference speeches I um, I went to a few years ago um, for an extra conference, a citizen science conference, was the, um, uh, uh, the Woodland Trust was talking about um, how they unsuccessfully and really badly launched a new website. Um, and how not to do it and that and it was a 10 minute session on what not to do um, and it was a real it was just great because it was it was an organization going we did it this way it really didn't work please no one else do it this way and I think sometimes there is a nervousness about sharing some of the challenges absolutely because people feel they're going to be judged um, in some way for what for what happened definitely and I think it's really interesting I think you know um, if if Caroline I know you said that you'd be happy to join it's just it's the blue button just at the top uh, <laughs> somewhere that should uh, request for audio visual but uh, oh there she is we've got a well she's coming in she's coming in as well Hello. 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 How's it going? <laughs> Thanks very much for letting me join you. That's great. It's been really fascinating, really sort of stimulating discussion, I have to say. It's a bit difficult actually to know whether to listen to you or look at the chat box and it's like going from one to the other. Now, my point was really about the market research because I've, I've worked in the NGO sector for 25 years and I was campaigns officer for the Wildfire Wetlands Trust at Slimbridge for many years um, and I was ran a pond watch it was called it was a campaign to encourage people to to make and care for ponds for wildlife because we had statistics to show that they were disappearing at a rate of knots out in the wider countryside and we did that and we got fantastic response we got 54,000 people on our database who were pledging to look after ponds for wildlife and I get people contacting me simply to tell me that they'd seen the frogs in the pond for the first time that year you know people loved it so we thought great we'll move this over to wetlands now um, and we actually did some market research to begin with and we found a completely different situation whereas we found people thought that wetlands was actually nature gone wrong that actually we needed to do something more productive and, and put nature right almost with with this so it meant that we had to completely change our approach to the campaign and the messages that we were putting out um, and so we started off by focusing on food we launched the campaign actually in a restaurant in London uh, with a, a menu cooked for us by an up-and-coming fashionable chef um, and we invited the media along because we wanted to we realized we had to make that personal connection to wetlands with people but uh, but I think market research is something that many um, organizations might think oh god you know can't do that it's too expensive but we actually used universities I got two universities involved because they're often their business departments have marketing uh, uh, modules in their, their studies and they're looking for real life projects to, to give their students experience and the students actually loved being part of this because they then felt they were doing something that was worthwhile it wasn't just made up for them to get a bit of practice that they're actually doing good at the same time so I suppose it just sort of urge people to you know go and talk to your local colleges mm. uh, if you've got business studies courses or, you, or local universities if you've got those you know and just see how they can get involved because unless you really understand and get under the skin of how people view the issue you just don't know what messages to put out there mm. and there's been interesting research in the past 10 years done to show that actually the public can be split up into four groups so there's the advocates who are the real deep greenies and want to save the world but they're only about 15 percent of the 
um, certainly consumers in this country. You have your aspirationals who want to do good but don't quite know how, but actually their peer group to them is the most important thing. They want to be seen to be part of the tribe. They're interested in fashion, they're interested in shopping. Um, so yeah, they want to do good, but all these other things are really important to them as well. And if their peer group and their influencers aren't doing it, then they won't likely do it. Then you've got the practicals who are the people who are really interested in price, product efficiency, convenience. They'll, if it's green as well, that's great, but they're not principally wanting to be green. And then you've got the indifference for whom, you know, you'll never persuade them to be greener until they've got, they can be, they'll be green because there's no other choice. And that was a really interesting piece of research work done called um, Rethinking Sustainability, Consumers and uh, the Future of, uh, um, was it Consumers and the Future of Sustainability? Yeah. Absolutely. So I, you know, it's, I think everybody's like us because we're so passionate. <laughs> but actually, yeah. this result, this survey suggested that most people aren't like us at all. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Caroline, as well. I think that speaks a lot to, to some of the things that yeah, you were saying, Sarah, as well, about kind of how we um, better embed things within communities. You know, we can design such beautiful calls to action that appeal to ourselves yeah. um, very well, but um, actually getting under the skin and understanding our audiences. And some of that can be done through kind of uh, market research techniques as well. And then there's also that kind of design insights i suppose thing as well of getting you know if market research is getting um you know 10 truths from 100 people um then design insights is that getting you know um one uh you know is 100 insights from 10 people um and you know understanding how things work for people um in in real life yeah. as well and I, I think the last thing i'd say is that it's it's really powerful in fundraising because i mm. i'm chief executive in environmental charity and i had to do a lot of fundraising and giving that evidence taking the evidence you yeah. got from the market search and that's proving it to the funders going look you know we know this is the case we know we're doing the right action because here's the research that's just helps with fundraising mm. so much Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thank Caroline. You. Thank you. Um, I'll, we'll boot you off as well. Thank you very much. Well, there's, a whole, there's a whole thread going about now uh, sort of developing a what not to do. I know. I, don't, I think some, <laughs> it's taken off. Some, it's really exciting. Someone seems to have, tried to have committed me to it as well. So it's creating work <laughs> oh for me. Um, so we've got about uh, three minutes left. Um, so oh, we, we've ru rushed right through, but I think mm. there's been a fantastic load of um, activity coming through on there. I think what would be a really um, nice way to, to sort of round up is I think what's been really interesting is that we've started from this point of, you know, we're, we're trying to come to come up with how we improve our practice as a sector around these kind of individual actions um, that people can can take um, and and how to how we we ask about these um, activities, and what we've really unpacked is that there's a huge amount of work to be done in the build up into those, and I think that you know there, there's potentially we're we're sometimes guilty of um, oversimplifying what we're doing and not necessarily getting under the skin of who and why we're asking these things to happen, um, but also really um, that that we shouldn't be doing this in silos and we really do need that kind mm. of either formal partnership approach or that kind of um at, at the least that kind of common language where we're all kind of at least pushing in similar directions but that there are a lot of barriers to partnership within that that where where we kind of that there's still more to unpick so it feels like there's still a huge amount to of work to do there's, there's so much conversation still happening and i think there's there's a really interesting bit that kind of to me that resonates between the bit that um that caroline uh, was just talking about the uh, understanding kind of the different audience and the motivations of different audience audiences generally in terms of getting involved and then there was a comment earlier on and i can't find who wrote it sorry but it, where we talk about when you're trying to understand the kind of when you're building relationships at a community level then you do need to kind of build trust and really get understand what's important to that community it's not a tick box exercise in the way that um understanding your audience generally shouldn't just be a tick box exercise it should be to inform decisions that you make about the project and where it goes um and yeah i think it's 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 easy 
to just go, oh yeah, we did some, we did some uh, audience segmentation tick. Uh, yes, we know there are, we've done our stakeholder analysis tick, but it's actually, it's, it's taking that evidence and doing something with it that's really important. Absolutely. And just to round us off as well in our, into entering our last 30 seconds. Um, so I've seen you know, some people sort of saying, you know, we'd be really interested in some more in, in collaborative opportunities. Um, you know, there is, it sounds like there's definitely a role for Communicate and this Communicate community. You know, there have been 800 people mm -hmm. registered for Communicate this year who've been kind of dropping in, dipping in and out or, or attending for the whole thing. Um, we have, the sector is here. Um, and so um, it, I think, you know, there's certainly a role and we'll be taking all of this chat and we'll be uh, we'll have a full download of it at the end of the event and we'll start wading through to to pull out some of these opportunities as well so we'll be back in touch but i've just dropped in the um pinned note on the chat as well a link to our um, feedback survey for the event and if you go into that and fill in that survey there's actually a specific part point in that feedback survey that um, asks about um, if you are interested in, I was contacting you after about um, potential joint collaborations with other delegates and, and other people in here as well. So I do recommend you mm -hmm. make sure you do that um, at the end of the conference um, as well. But um, we, we have, have so we. otherwise what I'll just need to do is thank everyone so much for your um, contributions, for getting really stuck into the chat. I think people have really, um, uh, Going. Thank you very much to everyone who joined us on screen and took the plunge um, as well. And thank you very much, Sarah, for helping uh, design and deliver this um, session as well. Thank you, Matt. And, and I really hope that um, this is kind of the starting point of, of something that will continue. Um, there's, a, there's a definite sort of sense and feel around partnership and collaboration. And yeah, I look forward to having conversations with lots of people. In Fantastic. Future. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.